Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be showing you how to customize the display of the G1000 and just some general tips around that. So today we're going to go ahead and pop into the nice lovely Baron. Now this is a 58, this is a lovely aircraft, and now we have this nice extremely expensive G1000 sitting in here. So if you thought things were expensive on a car, wait until you have to buy airplane avionics. It'll blow you away. Anyway, I digest. So one of the things is, is that I'm asked sometimes, people say, how do you set up the equipment in the plane? You know, we're not just talking actually turning it on and clicking buttons and things like that. We're talking about how do you customize the displays in such a way that makes most sense for you. You know, one thing that I'll start by saying immediately is I'm a huge fan of the minimalist approach. You know, in my mind, the most valuable thing to me as a pilot is just the information I need to know now. Any excess information, again, this is me personally, I find to be distracting and not necessarily helpful for me at all. So let's go ahead and take a look. So the first thing we're going to take a look at is our lovely PFD. This is usually the part that most people think of. Actually, let me go ahead and switch my CDI real quick. So it's actually locks on to what I told it to do. There we go. Uh, the first thing we'll do is look at this. Now, generally on this one, there's certain things we can turn on and there's certain things we can't turn off kind of a deal. Uh, one thing, of course, is if we have any warning lights. Um, I like to do things to make those warning lights go away. So I know that sounds kind of dumb, but every once in a while, you just kind of forget that that warning light was on there for something that you're actually concerned with. So unless we do something about it, you know, it's, we probably can take a moment to and fix that. Cool. So let's talk about the rest now. So these two tapes here are things that are not going to go away. They're again, our primary instruments. We have some backup instruments on this aircraft over there on the right in the event that those do fail us. And we also have a reversion mode, which is this big fat red button. You'll notice it doesn't do anything if you press it. Notice what it does is it throws um, the backup material on the left side of the display so that we, <laughs> it doesn't stay there very long, but it would have provided us with all that backup information on the left in case the right display had failed or it would flip the two. So the first things first is going to be this map in here in the bottom left corner. Some people really like this map. Uh, when I turn the sucker on and I press the layout button, it's going to give me a couple options. We have what they call the inset map, which is going to be this one that looks a little bit like this. By the way, to control the range, you can just come over here and give this a quick little wiggle waggle. So you can see there 10 nautical miles. I can zoom in, I can zoom out. And of course, the also critical uh, clearing out all the details you don't need. The other option is the HSI map. Uh, what that will do is that will actually project a map onto our actual HSI here. So you have the ability to kind of see roughly kind of what's coming up here. Now, some people are like, wow, this is uh, super useful. I'm glad that we have this. All right, Hotshot, could you tell me exactly how far off course we are? Ah, you notice this guy is up here now, but when I switch it back to here, it becomes more visible. So a lot of people are like, oh, I like this HSI map. Yeah, for maybe for VFR flying, but if I have a really precise line that I need to follow, especially if I'm following like a VOR or an ILS, this map is not going to do you much good, as handy as it is. So again, you can decide whether this makes sense. As a general result, for me, when I'm actually operating a G1000 in a real plane, I actually leave that completely off but it's just one of those features that some people really like, especially because you can show two different zoom levels. So you like have the close zoom here and the far zoom here. Either one works great. The next thing we're going to take a look at is we're going to take a look at the PFD Opt page. There's a lot of very useful information. And again, as I was saying earlier, most of my philosophy is dedicated to getting rid of things you don't need. Our first option is going to be our synthetic... Um, uh, terrain here. The one you're going to notice has got this handy dandy heading label. You can actually shut that off and that's going to show you roughly what the headings are, assuming you're close. And you can also click that button and disengage it completely. Now, synthetic vision is an incredible tool when you're flying an instrument approach. It's like cheating. But uh, where I operate because of 5G, a lot of synthetic visions actually gets damaged and you'll actually watch it change altitude on you, which makes it kind of dangerous. Uh, so as far as which one, do we leave this on? Do we leave it off? What do I typically do? I love using synthetic vision uh, when I'm in a situation where I need to spot something or the visibility is poor. But for actual regular flying, I actually leave synthetic vision off. Uh, one thing you have to keep in mind is in the real G1000, if we have a lot of traffic, it'll actually show up in the synthetic vision, which makes it worthwhile. Uh, the heading labels, completely up to you. Personally, I think this is fine for me, but if you need that, that is visible up, up top. The next option is going to be your wind option. There's a lot of different ways you can use the wind display. Uh, the first option is going to show you the cross. Uh, welcome to Connecticut, by the way. Those are normal winds for us. That's usually at ground level, not up here. But you can see we have a crosswind to the right of 18 knots, and we have a tailwind of 13 knots. So you have what they call the components of the wind. This is fantastic if you're trying to line up for an instrument approach and you're not sure what speed you need to hit it at. Now, option two gives us a handy-dandy little arrow, which just tells us we have a combined crosswind from basically behind us and to the right. And if I turn this mode on, it gives us both values. It'll actually tell us the exact heading of the wind, which can be incredibly critical if you're doing any sort of navigation. This little wind guy right here, I generally like to leave on at all times. This can be super helpful in instrument approaches, but generally this is one of the few options I do like to leave on in the real one, just because it's a little bit easier for me to spot what's going on. 
The DME is an interesting option. Uh, what this will do is this will provide you with any DME information. Now, you'll notice I'm not getting any right now. Uh, the reason being is I'm on a frequency that doesn't exist. Now, if I flip over to Hartford VOR real quick, I'll give it a second to actually capture it. Uh, uh, there's kind of oh, that was NAV2. I bet. Let me fix that real fast. All fixed. It should go ahead and say uh, probably 16, yeah, 16, 17 miles is roughly what I thought. So you can see this is the DME display. The reason I don't like this is if you actually were to turn on bearing two, you get a DME display built into the actual bearing itself. So if it's absolutely critical that you're following a DME arc, uh, let's say you're doing an approach that involves a DME arc, this can be your best friend because it makes it very obvious whether or not you're drifting one way or the other on it. Um, otherwise, you have this handy dandy piece here, which also provides you with the critical radial information should you need it. So again, it depends on exactly what you're doing. The other option we have is the bearing option. Uh, right now, I've got two different bearings going on at once. We have Hartford right now, and obviously we have Hartford over there as well. If uh, we wanted to, for example, pick another frequency, let's go up to uh, 115.60 here. That looks pretty easy. Whoop. Pop that one on. Let's see if we're close enough to pick it up. Yeah, we are. So you can see here that you can actually see the cross bearing between those two items, and you can use it as a way to triangulate your position if the GPS should fail. Uh, this is handy, but as you're probably noticing, it's starting to get a little messy. I really like using the bearings when I'm flying radials because I can, I'm sorry, arcs, because basically what you can do is keep that needle right to the right or right to the left of the aircraft and just keep an eye on the numbers. But otherwise, as you can see, it provides you with a lot of extra clutter that might actually make it more difficult to read what you need. A one neat trick here too is that your GPS will actually show you bearing it is on and everything, and it, of course, we're modified by that. Coming over here, we have the ability to actually change the altitude units. Uh, when you turn meters on, it's just going to tell you the meters. It's not actually going to change the unit up here. We also have inches versus HPA, uh, hexapascals, in case that you're in a country that gives you QNH versus QNE. To the right, uh, pushing that button I wouldn't recommend because it's going to do that. Uh, so what you can do there is you can, of course, change that mode as well. Uh, when we're done with this page, we're doing this. Uh, so what do I usually set this up? This is about as complicated as I like to get it. I don't like to go too much further than this. I just find it starts getting cluttered again. But again, that's me, and that's how I fly. Uh, over here, we have the OBS button. Uh, this is a magical button uh, that suspends waypoint sequencing. Uh, that's for another day. CDI is going to allow us to go ahead and uh, change what our navigational source is. You can see with GPS, we're in on route mode. We're not terminal, not LNAV, not LVNAV. Over here on the right is actually where ADF and our different DME options are. Now, what's going to happen here is if I choose an ADF station, as if there's any ADF left here, uh, I could actually dial in it here. But the more important thing on this particular page is if I use this big knob, not the little knob, I can go to where it says DME mode, and I can actually change the source of the DME. So if I were to go back over to my PFD options, turn my DME on, watch what happens if I change this to NAV2. Do you see how that switches over to the PVD versus uh, switching over to Hartford VOR? So that is a handy way to lock that on independent of whatever frequencies that you have actually selected there, which is actually kind of useful for some folks. I find that I don't need it very often, but if it is there, it is there, kind of a thing like that. So I'm going to pop that off, hit back. All right, so across the bottom, of course, we have a uh, transponder. I'm not going to go into these details. There's nothing I normally change display-wise. Ident, uh, timer ref. Uh, the nice thing about the timer ref here is this is where your timer is going to be located. Uh, let me show you what happens when you activate the timer, by the way. You'll notice we have this new display in the bottom right corner that says TMR, and it actually starts counting up. Notice, by the way, they're not perfectly in sync with each other. That makes me insane. So what's going to happen here is this will start going up and they will never be perfectly synchronized. That's actually not how it's designed to work. So what it'll do is you now have your timer visible, which is good for things like flight time. Generally, for me in the real world, when I start my engines, I start the timer. Uh, the reason being is I need to know how much I've flown so that I can put it in my logbook accurately. Uh, nearest, I'm not going to get into that. That's a display thing. It alerts, of course, if there are any warnings or anything, they're going to pop up there. So that's the general way I'm going to set this up. Um, again, people can do it differently depending on what they need. I just want to kind of show you where everything is. Everything else is relatively straightforward. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and press the menu button. Whoops, let me push that. You're going to notice there's a couple different options here. Uh, you're going to have one option that's going to allow you to set the brightness of your buttons. Now, the reason I like this is if this gets too bright, you can come in here and actually set this to manual mode, press enter, zip over here, and actually reduce the brightness of the display. Now, in the real world, um, the auto works really, really well, except when you have really sunny days, in which case it doesn't quite understand that I need it to be brighter. Uh, the nice thing here, of course, is if you ever really break it bad, you can just go back to the auto and it'll snap it back to the correct brightness. The only time I ever touch this in flight sim is if I'm flying at night, just because it makes it a little bit easier to see what I am doing. All right, that's all set on that side. Let's go shoot over to this one. Now, this one I have... <laughs> I like to joke, I have no idea who set this one up last because it's just not quite how I would do it. There's a couple different things you're going to have here. Uh, before we hit the buttons on the bottom, we're going to take a look at the menu button. 
the menu button is very handy because this is where we're going to have main map settings. So if I go up to the map settings at the top, I can press it and you can actually select the different options within what you're doing. There are so many options in here. So if I go to map, for example, I can set the orientation. Right now I have none, which is silly. So I'm going to go ahead and set heading up like the uh, God's intended and I'll leave it just like that. Uh, and one of the neat things is you'll see this north up above a thousand nautical miles. This is a neat trick. Watch this. I'm going to go set this to 500. And let me demonstrate how that works here. So I'm going to go ahead and clear out. Now watch what happens when I zoom out. Watch this. Ready, set, cross 500 miles. Here we go. See what it does? Kind of neat. So I'm going to zoom back in here because that's going to make me blind. Nice. Let's go back to the menu and press on map settings again. So that's super duper handy. Uh, we have terrain display. Um, of course, um, this is a Garmin device. So generally with terrain displays, um, you can pick many, many different modes here. You can have a uh, relative mode. You can have topo mode. I'm a huge fan of uh, topo mode myself. Uh, some people really like the default here. I like topo. It's just it's simple for me. But the important thing with topo is I just have to keep that in mind that um, it's not necessarily going to tell you if something's tall. It's just going to tell you there's stuff. So some people like the differences between there. We have a handy dandy topo scale option here. Uh, this is basically gonna provide you with a rough scale. Obviously you've got stuff in the way, so you're not gonna be able to see it. Go ahead and clear that out. And you can see the actual height of things uh, based on this little scale inside. I find this to be more clutter, but again, some folks really, really like to have that option of sitting over there on the right. So I'm gonna scroll down here. I'm actually gonna shut that back off. I don't, I'm not a big fan of that. A uh, track vector, I actually like to turn this one on. Let me go ahead and reduce that. I'm a huge fan of 30 seconds. I'll show you why in a second. Go ahead and turn the, uh, Welcome to having a noisy mouse, by the way. Uh, let's go down to 30 seconds is my preferred way to do it. And let me show you what that does. What you're going to see here is if you look really, really carefully, you'll actually notice that we have a line that tells us where we're tracking. Obviously, this blue line now is where our aircraft is uh, pointing. If I were to actually crank this up to 60 seconds now, you'll notice that line got a lot longer because this is showing us where we will be 60 seconds from now. Uh, right now, everything is so steady. You don't really see this thing wiggling back and forth. But in the real world, that track line will go everywhere, which is why I usually recommend making it a little bit smaller. It's very helpful for predicting things like traffic. Our select altitude arc, uh, that, that's kind of neat. Uh, that's basically going to give you a little arc for altitude. You're not going to see it from this range. I'd have to come all the way out for you to actually be able to see it. But I'm not going to fight that right now because I just don't need to. I'm going to shut that off. I never use it. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the options for our weather. Yeah, by the way, this is little for the little menus, big for the big menus. Weather is pretty cool. Uh, you can turn on next rad data should you need it. Um, it's pretty helpful. You can also set the maximum range that you're interested in the next rad data. There's not a lot of weather around us today as far as uh, where I'm flying in the world. So if I zoom way, way out, we're probably not going to pick any next rad up. Yeah, there's not going to be any next rad because there's just no nasty weather out there that I have to worry about. Going back to menu, I'm going to press our wet settings. We're going to scoot down. Our weather's nice. Traffic. Um, I like turning traffic on. There's no traffic. I've disabled it for videos. Uh, there's a traffic mode. And um, the cool thing here is you have our handy in the all traffic. And of course, you have the TA mode and the TAPA, depending on what you need. I just like all traffic. And of course, you can limit how far out the traffic can be. So what I actually like to do here is I like to set this to 100 nautical miles. And I like to turn on traffic labels when they get within 25 nautical miles. This is an excellent kind of trade-off between the two different modes, which makes it a little bit easier for you to identify them at the same time as, you know, know which ones are important based on the fact that they're changed differently. Aviation, um, these are good. You can turn on and off little airports. Obviously, for a big airplane, you can shut off the small airports. You can also, and this is really helpful, if you shut off intersections, you get rid of the millions and millions of dots on the screen. Um, that's up to you if you need to do that. I generally leave these on, especially if I'm zoomed significantly in. Airspace. Uh, this is super handy. Uh, this allows you to go ahead and dial what airspaces you want to see visible here. Let me go ahead and clear out and zoom out a little bit here. Um, difficult to see from this range, but you can see many, many of these little airspaces here and kind of where they're all drawn. Uh, we can shut those off if we want to, which makes the map significantly less clutter. Uh, so one of the things you can do is you can turn them on and off if you know you're going to be under them. Keep in mind, that doesn't mean the airspace went away. It just means it's not visible. Our air options, cool. If uh, you have any land targets, any waypoints you created, you can actually turn them on at this particular menu here, which actually works well. So that is generally how I set my uh, map up when I'm flying an aircraft with a G1000. Keep in mind, different versions of G1000s are going to kind of have different pieces here. This is just how I do it. This is what works best for me. And keep in mind, we can get out of that page by tapping that clear button at any time. So now we're going to go ahead and take a look at the stuff across the bottom here. Uh, the first one you're going to see is engine. Uh, we're not really interested in this. Uh, if you go to system, this is going to give you some of the critical numbers that you need, things like how much fuel. We also have our lean fine. We have our engine. A lot of times I fly around with this on just to kind of see exactly what my engines are doing on the particular aircraft. This works perfectly fine too because it just tells us what we need to know so i'm actually going to shut that off because i don't need to see it map options okie doke 
So the nice thing here is this simplifies most of the options we saw inside that menu. You have your traffic on and off. Keep in mind, that's going to be based on what we have. Notice, by the way, it says unrestricted over here in the bottom right corner. That's just to let us know what altitude options we've selected. Terrain mode is exactly what we saw before. We have off, we have topo, and then we have relative terrain mode, depending. I Like I said, I like topo, but obviously there's a place for using the other options. Some of these options don't exist yet. We can turn the weather on and off, as you saw. We can turn the legend on, and of course, we can go back. Last but not least, we have the detail button. Uh, this acts as detail presets. Uh, right now we're on all detail. If I press it on detail three, it's going to reduce some of the detail. If I do detail two, it reduces more. Detail one, I love detail one. You can see it basically eliminates everything but the absolute massive critical things we need to do here. Downside to that, of course, is you lose the critical air spaces. Notice all, it's going to give you everything. Three is going to give you everything. Two is going to just leave you the airports. One is going to eliminate you just with everything that you have remaining. This is very helpful. Uh, one of the nice things, too, is you can actually come over here, and uh, normally that's what your clear button would do, but it's a little bit different on this version of it. All right. Hopefully that helps you as far as uh, determining what settings. Like I said, this is basically how I would set it up. And in Flight Sim, this is generally how I set it up. Sometimes if I'm doing a very challenging approach, I'll activate the inset map and use it at a different zoom. I'll do something like, uh, let's go grab that real quick. I'll do something like that. But what I'll do with the inset map is I'll actually clear everything out and try to reduce as much detail in this as possible so that it doesn't give me an incredible headache when I'm actually trying to operate a kind of a thing like that. Detail, you can go drop the detail down to one. And of course, if you need to, you can turn on uh, traffic over here. You can actually use this as a traffic rate. Radar. One of the things I like to do is I actually turn that on, zoom, take the zoom, go out to like 100. Now, anybody whose traffic will now be visible on this, independent of this display. So it actually acts as a little backup. But like I said, I almost find this to be a little cluttering. So that can make that a little bit challenging. And of course, if we're worried about any sort of terrain or weather, we can flip that on at any time. Other than that, enjoy.